Hello everyone, welcome back to today's build. I'll be your guide to this wonderful game we all love. Let's get started. Today's deck features a classic member of the Commander format with a much closer examination of her deck. Her name is Brea, Ethereum Shaper, and this is the Godfather's Refuse. Brea is a 4-4 artifact human that makes two 1-1 blue Thopters when she enters the battlefield. And if we can pay two mana and trash two artifacts, we can lightning bolt the player or planeswalker, give a creature neg 4 neg 4 until end of turn, or gain 5 light. Brea is really great at controlling the board when she lands. She can hit creatures, even indestructible ones, as well as planeswalkers with her first two abilities. Despite how controlling she can be though, in the years since her first printing in 2016, the internet has decided she's a combo deck. We won't scrap that idea just yet, but we're not fully committed to it either. That being said, one curious piece of text on Brea that you might miss is the fact that she makes Thopters that are blue artifacts, which means Thopter Foundry, Grand Architect, and Unctus Grand Metatect all work really well here. And both Thopter Foundry and Grand Architect are famous combo pieces with her so the combo route is certainly an option. For me though, the first thing that I notice about Brea that seems to disagree with her EDH rec page is that, just like Megatron, this is not an artifact deck. This is an artist sack deck. Nothing about Brea helps you cast artifact spells or rewards you for casting them. But so much of the top cards on her EDH rec page do. Foundry Inspector, Psy, and Joyra all care about casting artifacts but it feels like we'd be better served by focusing on effects that want our existing artifacts to go to the graveyard. After all, our commander sends our artifacts to the yard two at a time, but we only draw one card a turn, so we'll burn through our artifacts faster than we can cast them. Moreover, unlike Megatron, who rewards us for going tall with artifacts, Brea cares more about quantity than quality, and she doesn't really care whether they're tokens or not, unlike Megatron. She'll have us go wide with artifacts. And, if you didn't notice, she makes those artifacts when she enters the battlefield, so we'll be on the lookout for ways to do that. This commander has been around for a long time, and the internet's collective conscious has contributed a lot to this deck. We'll see if we can't challenge any of those contributions today. This is a long one, so bear with me. To start with, Liberator Urza's Battlethopter is strictly better than Shimmermere. Ditch the mirror, embrace Thopter. Padim, Console of Innovation, is 4 mana here to give our artifacts hexproof but the timing is both really awkward and really slow. The earliest we could play her is turn 4, but if we do that, then what are we not playing on turn 4? Why, it's our commander! So Padim really comes down at earliest on turn 5, and wouldn't be drawing any cards until turn 6 if we have the most expensive artifact on the field, and that's not likely to happen at that point in the game especially given how low the average Brea curve is. The protection that Padim gives us is minimal as well. Yes, Hexproof is good, but if our opponents are targeting our artifacts, we can just sacrifice them to Brea. The benefits we get from making them Hexproof are next to none. I think Padim is out. Swords to Plowshares is always good, but 51% uh, of decks? Really? Our commander already deals with creatures and planeswalkers really effectively, and Swords to Plowshares can only hit creatures. If this needs to be a removal slot, I think this deck would be better served with a Vanish into Eternity at least, since that's more likely to hit non-creatures, or maybe an artifact that can kill something at most, but that's if I decide I want a removal spell on this slot. Ditch the Swords. Mer Retriever is in 38% of Brea decks, and Scrap Drawler is in 31% of Brea decks. But as noted before, our commander puts artifacts in the graveyard, so shouldn't these kinds of effects be more popular? Moreover, if 31-38% to 38 of decks are sacrificing enough non-token artifacts to play these cards, then why don't we run Ferret? Why isn't Slagstone Refinery even showing up here? Trawler replaces dead artifacts with artifacts in our hand, but in fewer than 5% of Brea decks, the refinery replaces dead artifacts with artifacts on the battlefield. And could you imagine having them both out? The refinery essentially doubles the number of times we can activate Brea's ability, and since Power Stones can activate abilities, those activations can pay for themselves, unlike our treasures. It's just too efficient to not include, and I think we cut Mirror Retriever for it. Master Transmuter is in 39% of our decks, not to help cheat mana on our expensive artifacts, because again, our curve here is pretty low, 
but probably because it lets our commander enter the battlefield over and over again, generating more Ethopters each time. But this ability is attached to a creature, so it's got summoning signals. And just like Padim, that 4 mana cost to play it makes for some awkward timing casting our commander. Why don't we play Ephemerate instead? They're about the same price, and at instant speed for 1 mana instead of the 6 it would take with the transmuter to blink something twice, we could blink our commander or any other non-token artifact to get two rehashes of their enter the battlefield effects, which, by the way, since we're exiling these artifacts, also gets a trigger off Slagstone Refinery, whereas Master Transmuter wouldn't. In the same vein, if we're playing Disciple of the Vault, why not also run Psychomancer? Oni Cult Anvil looks like a slam dunk at first blush, but it only replaces artifacts if we lose them on our turn, and we're trying to interact on other people's turns. In addition to being an artifact itself, with all the cost-reducing effects we have, Psychomancer and Disciple are likely the same mana value, and Psychomancer, like Refinery, will trigger when our non-tokens go to exile as well as the graveyard. On top of that, it also gains us life when we do this. Thopter Foundry, Sword of the Meek, and Ashnod's Altar form one of the more popular combos in this deck, but for my money, this sucks. It takes up three card slots, which is already difficult to assemble, but it gains you infinite life and makes infinite Thopters. But they don't have haste. This combo does not win you the game, it just makes you the target. You can easily have your win stolen from you, and if it takes up three card slots to pull this off, we should be winning from this. But more than that, the only one of these pieces that even kind of does something for us, apart from combo, is the Foundry. We don't need another sack outlet from Ashnod's Altar, our commander does that already. And we don't need more colorless mana from it either. With the cost reductions we get on our artifacts, we need colored mana way more than anything else. I think we're going to focus more on the Grand Architect combos instead. If we're running Icker Wellspring, we should also be playing Prized Statue. And as much as I love Nihil Spellbomb, I think Canoptech Scarab Swarm would be a better piece of graveyard hate for us, since it can provide more artifacts and it gets flickered by all of our blink spells. Lastly, a card I want to make sure we avoid is Semblance Anvil. Yes, it's an artifact that could easily make all of our artifacts and creatures too cheaper to play, but it also eats another card to do this. And one thing you learn very quickly piloting this deck is that it burns through cards very quickly. We need the cards more than the cost reduction. Throw this in the scrap pile. So what's our timeline? Our commander is really good at removal, but most casual decks aren't going to have a lot worth removing early on so Brea doesn't have to come down as early as possible. In fact, unlike a lot of other commanders that generate more value the longer they're out, Brea generates a very fixed amount of value, and it's something we have to spend resources to fuel, so there's no real reason to play her too far ahead of the curve. On turn 1, we have Esper Sentinel, Disciple of the Vault, and Soul Ring. On turns 2 and 3, we really want Ethereum Sculptor, Enthusiastic Mechanaut, and Foundry Inspector in our opening hand for this because it means the next turn we could ramp for cheaper and play out another artifact. We're also playing Third Path Iconoclast, Scrap Trawler, and Urza, Lord Protector, to further reduce costs of both developing our board and interacting with our opponents. Notably, both pieces of Urza's meld fit right at home in this deck, so we'll include that as well. With some preliminary setup, our commander comes down on turn 4. Now that we've made it to turn 5, we've got some very spicy includes. First up is the Mightstone and Weakstone, Inspired Tinkering, and Research Thief. By this point in the game, we'll be lower on cards already, and the Power Stones can ramp as well as refill our hand, while Inspired Tinkering is essentially 2 mana to draw 3 if we play those cards this turn, and if we don't, we get to hold onto those cards, and we've ramped. The Thief can be held up if we feel like we need to interact with our opponents this turn, and draw us more cards later. Also in this slot, we're running a copy of Great Desert Prospector, which will generate between 3 and 6 Power Stones with our commander out, and can be blinked with our blink effects, as well as SRAM's Expertise and Access Denied, which all generate a wealth of artifacts. On top of all this, we've put together enough pieces with Synergy for it to play a small blink sub-theme. 
Ephemerate, Lazelle's Acrobatics, and Eerie Interlude can save a lot of our board in a pinch, as well as trigger all of our Enter the Battlefield effects, and get additional triggers off of Psychomancer and Slagstone Refinery. Moreover, since our commander asks us to hold up mana on our opponent's turns anyway, all of our instant speed spells get that much better. Blink and you'll miss it. We'll use cards like Fabricate and Wishclaw Talisman to dig up the remaining pieces of our combo, and potentially sacrifice Talisman to keep our opponents from getting a tutor. Since we're already running some of these cards like Grand Architect for intermediate value pieces, our endgame will be to combo off with Pilipala and Grand Architect, which can generate infinite mana, sacrifice our commander to herself over and over again, generate infinite thopters, and ping our opponents out for infinite damage. I'm also putting in a Ghostly Flicker Dual Caster Mage combo, since Ghostly Flicker is already really good for us anyway with our Enter the Battlefield effects, and the combo would only be one extra card at that point. This deck is a lot different from the other decks we like to make. Our commander burns through our cards really quickly, so it's hard to really push this into a dedicated combo deck like I would want this to be. And at the speed we're casting our commander, we're definitely not winning by turn 6 reliably at all. The biggest strength of this deck, though, is how resilient it is. I've been hit with a Vandal Blast more times than I can count, and I always bounce back from it like it's nothing. Today, we run a very proud 8. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching!